Welcome back to SAMCAST, the podcast by the Students' Association of Management and Marketing at the University of Melbourne. We aim to be the go-to discussion space for all things considered in the world of management and marketing and how it links to you, your uni life, and future career. Our co-hosts today are myself, Gabrielle, and Steph. This week, in honour of International Women's Day, we will be interviewing three inspiring women who have all pursued careers in management. We hope that everyone listening to this episode can learn something from their careers and feel empowered to pursue a managerial role. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kelly, Shani and Bronwyn. Would you guys all like to introduce yourselves? I'm happy to go first. First of all, thanks for having me on the podcast today. It's a real pleasure to to come back as someone who was part of the association when I was at uni. My name is Shani. I currently work in our consulting business within PwC. I've been there almost four years now, and I started as a grad after I finished my commerce degree at Melbourne Uni back in 2016. So I currently work in our government and public sector division, and I do a lot of work across a huge variety of clients and types of projects, a lot to do with operating model, efficiency, change implementation, and I actually have done a few pieces recently related to COVID response, whether that's in the health sector or in general business redesign. So it's definitely a really interesting time to be working in government consulting. Yeah, wow, that sounds so cool. Uh, I'll jump in. Also echoing, Shani, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honour to be amongst these women and talking on this particular podcast. So my name is Kelly Tyson. I am the head of the demand generation marketing team at Telstra in the enterprise division. I've been in marketing for about 15 years in a variety of roles across B2B and B2C. And I've been at Telstra for about eight years in a variety of roles there. So hopefully I can bring some of that to the podcast today. And lucky last, thank you also. I feel very privileged to be able to speak on International Women's Day. Um, My name is Bronwyn and I am the People and Culture Manager at Impressive Digital. Prior to starting at Impressive approximately 15 months ago, I was with uh, McDonald's Australia. So very different experiences working in the two companies and really enjoying enjoying the change. That's so great. It's amazing having such diverse careers and experiences here today. So in this next section, we'll be kind of looking at our guest experiences as women in managerial roles. I suppose for all of you, looking retrospectively, our student audiences are kind of in a position where, I mean, maybe you were previously to where you got today. So I guess when you were in our positions, did you kind of have like a dream job? And how did you plan your career progression? So yeah, maybe Kelly, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. So very early on in my career, I actually moved around interstate a lot and I probably wasn't planning out career progression, but it kind of forced me to progress in my career because I was changing jobs so frequently and I probably didn't always feel ready for that. But it's kind of then ingrained a bit of an appetite in me to be constantly pushing myself and progressing through my career. And I guess what I found out of that is the market has changed so rapidly that I didn't really have a dream job or a 10-year plan or even a five-year plan because I never knew what opportunities would exist down the line like that. But What I did always want to do was work for brands that I believed in. I'm a marketer. I love brands. And I always wanted to work for brands and products that I really believed in. And I've been really lucky to have that. So I think my approach has been don't think too far ahead. But when I have been looking at that career progression, the approach I've taken is don't just think about this job that you're applying for, but think about just the one after that. And where is this job leading? What do I need to get out of this particular job that's going to get me there? And and that served me pretty well. Students in COVID can especially relate to that kind of uncertainty and not really knowing what's coming next. I guess, Sharni, how have your experiences been with that? And were they different at all? Yeah, so I think for me, the challenge is is that I never really knew where I wanted to go. I knew that I was really interested in different areas of business management and in marketing, but I didn't really have a clear cut goal of this is the career that I want or this is the dream job. So I basically was like, where can I go that I'm going to get a great experience as a student who has learned a lot, but doesn't quite have experience with the corporate world yet that will help me 
explore really broadly because for me I love to try and test different things to figure out what suits me and that was honestly consulting because you try to define what's management consulting no one can define it because it means so many different things so that's how I ended up in my role and honestly where I am now is still using the perk of being in this industry to keep testing different things so trying different industries when I was at uni I always thought that I would end up in retail and consumer industries I really liked fashion and that was what I knew and found interesting and then when I explored more of that work, I was like, okay, that's great. But I, I want something that has a bit more of a social bottom line that's going to be more impactful for society. And that's how I kind of got more interested into health industry and government and working with universities and, and working with various government departments and organisations. So that's kind of where I am now that I'm like, all right, I'm starting to figure out more what gets me going in the morning, what makes me feel like what I'm doing has a real impact. And now let's play around a bit and find out more of where my skills and passions lie from a capability standpoint. Do I really want to do service design or product design or helping organizations optimize how they're structured and operate to be more efficient and, and save taxpayer money and use that as a way to explore what's the market? What are the jobs out there? Because honestly, I, I'm still learning what's out there. So I don't really know for sure where I'm going to be in, in five or 10 years. I'm four years into my career and I still really don't know where I'm going. And the funny thing is, is I'll speak to people who are 10, 20, 20 years into the industry as well and they say to me shiny I still don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up and I love that honestly I love that true <laughs> I was just going to say you know I think the thing that's been really interesting that I've noticed a lot more throughout my career and that I've probably been learning along the way but I feel as though graduates coming into the business know straight away today is looking for businesses that do align with their values and that's something that I've really built and I'm happy to have found in my work but I really applaud those people that really know from the get-go that they want to sort of work for a place that aligns with their values. And to Shani's point around people saying, I still don't know what I want to do. I've seen a lot of people that have really built niches in B2B or B2C or services or all of these different fields. And I think that that's super valuable. It's probably not been my journey, but the other side of that has also been that now I'm in a point in my career where it's really valued that I've got very broad experience and those skills around embracing ambiguity and dealing with change and learning and developing insights really quickly. These are skills that are always going to take you a long way in marketing. So I think don't feel the pressure to know what your dream job is right now because you can kind of grow into that and you can embrace maybe not even having that. Yeah. Ron, what I was going to say, going from McDonald's even to Impressive Digital, how do you feel about the whole like broad skill set and dream jobs changing? Absolutely. So I never actually had a dream job and becoming a mum at a really young age when I was just starting out in my career kind of really turned that on its head. So not only did I really want to spend time and was really motivated to establish a career but I also had to balance that with family as well so one of the things that really helped me and has supported me in my career is just to make the most of every opportunity that's available to you and to constantly learn and ask for feedback and when I got feedback that was telling me yep yeah, you're doing a great job or tracking along nicely for me that wasn't enough I, I appreciated the pats on the back but I, that wasn't going to stretch me and help me grow as a person and also learn and develop new skills. So for me, I never had the, the dream job. I've kind of just fallen into different roles, if you like, just because I've made the most of every opportunity available. I made sure that I had the, the skills and the knowledge, but also the courage just to, to give things a go and to learn from, from your mistakes. And I totally relate when people say, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up because I'm now in my early 40s and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And, and things change. You, what you enjoy doing and what your priorities and values are they change as you grow as a person. So you might have several different career changes along your journeys. It's great that people have the courage and opportunity to be able to do that. I definitely think that's a great takeaway just from what all three of you were saying, just saying yes to more things and taking on opportunities, kind of believing in yourself and following through. Do you guys have a particular female role model that has inspired you throughout your career, either someone you know personally or a more well-known platform? 
when I actually think back on my career, I actually can't think of too many male bosses that I've had along the road. So when I think back on female role models, I've actually just had a selection. I've been so fortunate to just have so many female role models that have inspired me in my career. And it's always been in really different ways. So to me, that's just demonstrated the value of different leadership styles, different values. It helps you to pick the best bits of each of them along the way to be the marketer, to be the leader that you want to be. They've all played a role. I can't pick any favourites. I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it's nice to know that you have been exposed to a lot of female role models because I feel like I'm just kind of fresh out of school and a fresh out of girls' school where a lot of like the leadership team was all women. So I was used to that at school, but it's nice to know that kind of continues into the workplace as well. I mean, I've definitely had a couple of males scattered in there and definitely had some senior males that I've worked with that have been very supportive. But when I try and think back of one particular, I just couldn't pick. They're all so important. How about you, Bronwyn? I know you were ready to jump in there. Yeah, uh, my experience is, is quite different. Unfortunately, it's only sort of been in the last maybe five to eight years where I have had the opportunity and experience to really work with some inspiring female leaders and learn from their experiences and, and the way they interact in business and in management because it is quite different as women our style and the way we go about our communication and decision making is very different to men and so it's good to have that opportunity to be able to learn from female leaders. That's an interesting point like hearing your different experiences with that. How about you Sharni? Yeah, so for me, when it comes to female role models within my company, within PwC, I have the benefit of because we're project based, every few months you're rotating and working with new people. So something that I've noticed myself actively doing is picking people that resonate with me that I work with and using them as role models. And that can be someone who's one year ahead of me five years ahead of me, 10, 20 years ahead of me, picking people at different stages of their career and figuring out what is it that I appreciate about them. And it's often they're the people that really put a lot of trust into those working under them. They don't play hierarchy. They know their experience, but they respect and value what others have to bring. They're the ones that are personable and aren't afraid to bring their authentic full selves to work. And they honestly just just you have a good time with them you want to work with them and for them because you feel like they value as a person and, and the capabilities that you bring as well if I have to point out one person outside of PwC that that I currently would say is a role model that would probably be Sally Kath Lord Mayor she's cool um, so she's someone that kind of come onto my radar the last year and I think it's really great to have prominent females within Melbourne and within Australia trying to lead great things for society trying to support the challenges that we're going through with COVID and obviously that she's just been re-elected means that she's doing a good job so I just think she's a really great example of women being visible strong leaders and the conversation not really being about the fact that they're female but more just about the role that they're playing that's really interesting even just thinking about the different ways that women can be leaders and how it's different to maybe having men in, as leaders in the workforce you'll probably all answer this question differently just based on what you were saying before but do you find that there's a big divide between men and women in the workplace, just in terms of not necessarily only numbers, but even the way they're respected or just the way they're treated? Yeah, I mean, I have to be honest. I'm in a workplace that has put a real emphasis on diversity ever since I've been in the firm, and that's gender diversity, cultural diversity, all elements of diversity. And so I've actually been in a lot of teams that are very female-led, which some people reflected that that wasn't necessarily the norm a few years back. It's interesting because it might be that it's more related to, to industries or different areas. The area that I work in is, at the end of the day, it's about building relationships with the clients, understanding the human elements of a business. It's not just about coming in and figuring out what's going to be the most efficient thing. And I think that's more personality and empathy driven which I think isn't necessarily tied to a gender so I think I'm lucky to be in a workplace where they've made a real effort to be inclusive to the point where you don't really notice any gender disparity anymore but I know that that hasn't necessarily been the case the whole time and it hasn't necessarily it isn't necessarily the case for every organization it's exciting to hear that PwC is kind of taking that ethos on so strongly Bronwyn how have your experiences been similar or different yeah I think starting out in my career business was very male dominated 
And it can be quite intimidating at times when you're in a room of 50 people and there's only two or three females. And it really takes a, a lot of confidence just to walk into the room, let alone, you know, have a voice and have your say. It's great to see that, especially over the last 10 years, there has been more of a shift of having women represented across different sections of the, the corporation, as well as many different levels as well. One thing that's really important to me is inclusion. So there's the diversity that a lot of companies have now of, of targets that they would like to meet. But for me, that just ticks one box. I want to be at a place where everybody feels really valued and included. So not only do they have an opportunity to be there, but they feel really comfortable that their value, their voice can be heard, is appreciated just as much as anybody else. So for me, I tend to really work on inclusion now rather than diversity, because that to me is really what it's all about. I think managers like yourselves, you know, are very much responsible for building that environment of inclusion. So it's great to hear that that's important to not only you guys, but your companies. Kelly, would you agree that I guess it does come down to sort of culture and building that culture of inclusion in the workforce? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, the industry that I'm in at the moment, which is technology or telecommunications, as well as some of my previous industries, real estate, workwear, I definitely still see a hangover of the systemic development of males and females into different career paths, right? So maths and computers for boys. So that's careers in commercial and, and IT for the boys and, you know, it's marketing and HR for the girls. So I do see a lot of unconscious bias in teams being built that don't bring enough diversity and perspectives and experience in all of that to the table and the power imbalance that creates which I guess is what we're saying here is it's having that voice at the table so when I am at the table I'm absolutely respected it's not a question of not being respected and treated equally when we get there but that's maybe where the difference in experience has come through so I do agree that diversity is just half of the battle in getting there but it's also around for me setting really strong examples of the kind of career paths that women or any of the other examples of diversity take on what those kinds of career paths take and making sure that we've got something for people of diverse ages cultural background education neurodiversity gender can all aspire to yeah it's very good to see obviously diversity in the workplace has come so far I'm even doing a topic next semester called gender diversity in the workplace, there is still some stereotypes that exist today. Have you ever experienced any lack of confidence or self-doubt because of these stereotypes? I mean, maybe Bronwyn, you'd like to start talking about just walking to a room filled with just men? Absolutely. I have really only started to tackle my self-doubt issues probably in the last three or four years, to be honest. And it was a skill that I had to, to learn. So many times in business, as a woman, you're either really seen as strong and tough, so you get labelled the bitch, yeah. or you show a softer side, you, you're more personable, but then you're kind of labelled emotional, right? Mm -hmm. where, where men they don't fall into those two buckets quite as often as as women do. So for myself, I really had a bit of a struggle with how do I be myself in my workplace, but not seen as weak or emotional. So that was something that I really had to learn how to do and, and build my confidence to be able to do that. And, you know, I've learned just to be myself, be authentic and can be, be strong, but I can also have that softer, gentler side when I need to, and when it's appropriate. And being in a place that values that so you don't get that label attached to you. And would you say over time it was more just resilience that helped you build up your confidence or is there something else that you tried to tell yourself? Yeah, I would say I definitely built up resilience, but also learning that failure isn't, isn't failure. Like we, it's okay to make mistakes and that's how we learn and grow as individuals. I tried to be perfect because... There weren't as many women around. I, I felt that there was added pressure on me that, one, I was a role model for other people as well. So I had to try and be perfect all the time, which is a huge burden and a huge weight. And it does really affect your, your confidence. So for me, just learning that I don't have to be perfect. I'm human just like the boys are. And, you know, I, I will make mistakes and, and that's okay as long as I learn and grow from them and 
I think that's something that I'm now trying to sort of teach women around me and, and those that look up to me and, and ask for help and advice. Is it's okay to make mistakes. Like that's how we learn and grow and develop as, as people as well as in our chosen careers. That's really interesting. I was going to say, Sharni, have you ever experienced that self-doubt about even like your capability and that kind of thing too in the workforce? You've asked the exact question I wanted to answer, bring board off of what Bronwyn was saying. Something that I've struggled with throughout my career, but especially earlier on, was something called imposter syndrome. And that is that feeling that, oh, I don't belong here, I'm putting on a facade, or I'm not really as smart and capable as people think I am, I'm not deserving of this role. And I actually picked up, and I think there's been some research done in this topic, and there is a bit of a pattern that shows that this is something that's experienced by everyone of all genders, but there is a bit of a trend for it to be more so for women. And the example that I give, particularly when it comes to applying for a job or a promotion, If you have a list of, say, 10 capabilities or attributes that they're looking for for the role, a woman will look at that and see, oh, I've only ticked eight out of 10. I'm not there yet. But a man might be more likely to look and say, oh, I've got eight out of 10. Like, I'm basically there. Like, I've got this. And what I really had to learn was that it's that self-perception and self-talk that can be the number one detractor. And exactly as Bronwyn said, that you don't have to be perfect and and no one's expecting you to be perfect. For me, when I learned to back myself and hold myself with more of that confidence, I realized that was the main thing that's standing in the way between me and someone I aspire to be like. It's not necessarily that that person is more capable than me, but they might be more confident than me. It's good to be aware of your development opportunities, but it's also good to be aware of your strengths. And I think as women, we might place more emphasis on where we think our deficits are and our weaknesses are, as opposed to saying, I'm really good at this and writing off of that and remembering that that's what you have to offer. So for me, that's the biggest reflection I have when it's approaching the challenges, fitting into a new role. And the reality is that you're always going to be challenged. You're always going to feel like you're learning. You're never going to feel like you're there. You're always going to feel like you're developing. So just just keeping that in mind and, and learning the way to reflect on yourself so that you don't let that imposter syndrome take over, that's what's going to enable you to, to push forward and continue to progress and continue to back yourself so you can grow in your career. It's crazy how important positive self-talk is and what a difference that can have. And I think that's something we all need to remember, just being kind to ourselves. Kelly, would you say that you've had similar experiences? And I guess, how have you sort of coped or overcome them? Yeah, I think that imposter syndrome is almost every woman's worst constant companion. Um, So absolutely, I would say for a long time there, I would have experienced it every single day. And so would many of the women around me. But I think that the biggest step in overcoming that was I've had really supportive leaders that have made me realise it's not a reality. So it's recognising when you feel that way that it's not actual and it's not serving you and it's around focusing on developing habits that break that cycle instead of perpetuating it and if I think of some of the things that Bronwyn and Shani have said absolutely if you're not making mistakes you're probably not stretching yourself enough and when I think of some of those stereotypes that Bronwyn mentioned around as a female leader being stereotyped as being overly emotional I would say to that I embrace vulnerability in my leadership style and my team really values that because none of us are robots and if someone perceives my behaviour as being bitchy or bossy instead of strong and decisive, you know, to all of those stereotypes, I would just say I don't think that the challenge here is that the person being stereotyped needs to overcome it. I think that this needs to be overcome by the person doing the stereotyping. So if you've got a problem with vulnerability and leadership, I would question why you're struggling with that rather than how I change myself to fit your definition of ideal leadership. And I'm certainly not recommending that we all go to all of our stakeholder groups and say my way or the highway. We absolutely need to adapt to some of those different stakeholder groups. But yeah, sometimes the problem isn't with you as well. No, it definitely seems like the onus is often on women to try to fix, you know, gender inequality and that kind of thing. I was going to say, I think it comes down to developing that self-confidence, whether it's to have the conversation with, with the person or whether it's just to have that confidence within yourself to be able to understand that it's not actually you and that it's the other party and to, to keep going on your your path and and your journey and not letting that stereotype detract from who you are as a person and also where you want to be and grow in your career. 
Yeah, I think even going along the lines of confidence and imposter syndrome, I think it's just a well-known fact that males are just more likely to apply for a role that they are slightly underqualified for as opposed to women. Have you guys felt this way personally in your career? Yes, absolutely. So I recently changed careers and uh, it was the first time I actually had to really start applying for jobs and roles. I was making sure I was ticking, you know, eight of the, the 10 boxes and I actually sort of had some self-realisation and thought, you know what, just put yourself out there because there's certain skills and, and qualities and strengths that I have that don't necessarily make it onto the checklist or, or the job ad. So it was more about just really backing myself, putting myself out there to see what opportunities would present themselves and not being scared to get rejected either. What about you, Shani? Yeah, I mean, look, I haven't been in the position yet where I'm applying for other jobs. I'm still in the same employer from my graduate role and I'm very happy there. But I can reflect on it in terms of promotions because where I work, we have a process where you have to put yourself forward for a promotion. And the first time going through that process, I was really like wanting to make sure I was 100%. And I picked up on that with other females in similar career states that they wanted to make sure they were really 100% ready and maybe they might wait a little bit. Whereas I noticed it was more likely for men to say, oh, look, um, I might be most of the way there. I'll just chuck in a case and and see what happens. And I've seen that happen recently and in my cohort with some people being promoted earlier than others. And I actually sat back and reflected and was like, what's different between me and that person? And I honestly had that realization where I was like, I don't think capability wise it is, it's it's confidence, it's it's visibility or maybe networking and all of that. And it, it's actually quite funny. This might be a bit of a side note, but I've actually got an invite for something tomorrow. There's a female leaders initiative that's actually been kicked off in my area of PwC. We've got a few women spearheading that and there's about 40 or 50 women invited to this series of events. The first one's going to be on personal branding tomorrow and I know there'll be some other themes. So I think employers and, and employees within companies are starting to recognize these patterns and starting to say, you know, it's time to do something about it. And I think it's amazing. Yes, we're starting to see more women there, but also we're starting to see that sometimes it's not just about, as we talked about before, being invited into the room. It's about having a seat at the table. It's about doing those things to uplift each other and all of those less systemic and more personable and networky things that can also stand in the way of progress. So let's start to break those down. Let's network how men do. Let's back ourselves like how men do and realize that sometimes those things are the things that might be standing in our way, not actually our capabilities or aptitudes. I guess we were kind of talking about this a bit before, like in terms of barriers, but are there kind of any institutional barriers that you guys see preventing women from getting into the C-suite? I know as a committee, we were kind of talking about things like 31.8% of managers are women in consulting and like management related fields and that kind of thing. Does it come down to self-confidence or why aren't women getting into the C-suite? I'm also happy to jump in and I want to caveat this up front saying I'm not a parent And I don't mean in any way to say anything that might make any parents on the call uncomfortable. But I've spent a bit of time looking into these statistics and where it comes from. And what research has said is the reality that it's come down to traditional parenting norms and expectations around that stemming from employers. So I think the reality is, and I've had a lot of conversations about this with women and men, and it's really great to get the dialogue going, When women reach a certain age, the expectation is that they will have children. And the tradition has been that the woman, if they're in a heteronormative couple, will take more of the time off to raise that child. And that can be at a time where they're in a middle or senior management position at a very pivotal time of their career. They can lose anywhere from one to more years taking time off to be a parent. And then when it's time for them to re-enter the workforce, they might need to negotiate some type of part-time arrangement. And traditionally, if they were in a relationship with a man, the man wouldn't be taking an equivalent time off. So the reality is they've taken a break, which has stalled their progress, then they've come in and they're needing to negotiate some flexible working arrangements. And traditionally, that has stalled careers. And that is something that is systemically shown to to stop that progress. What's really exciting now, and to put the positive spin on this, is that I think people are becoming more aware of these expectations and are changing the conversation expectations. So I know personally from my experience, my employer provides equal parental leave for any parent taking time off. I've seen many 
men that I've worked with take a six month parental leave so that their partner can get back into the workforce sooner. And I've worked with a lot of women that do part-time working arrangements. Some of them are parents, some of them aren't. It's all about work-life balance and what you want and seeing those women progress and not have part-time working or flexible working impact their progression is really inspiring. And I think the awareness that having a child is a, a great thing for people's lives and it shouldn't be something that detracts only from women's careers, it should be something that's shared equally, is something that's really starting to change the tune of that. And also calling out employers for their biases to not be presuming, well, if I hire this woman and she's, you know, in her late 20s, early 30s, and like, is she going to be going on maternity leave? Because either A, some women don't want to have children, or B, that actually shouldn't matter. It's all about the quality of the candidate. So I think that's something that traditionally has been impacting those statistics, but I think it's something that's changing because people start to speak up and say, nah, -uh, we're not playing into these stereotypes anymore. We're not, we're not living like this. This is a very cool playing field and parenting is a shared responsibility. It's not just a woman's responsibility. I think it's great you mentioned that. Even just growing up, it always seemed like either you have a career or you have a family, like as a woman, and it was never an issue for the man. The burden was always on the woman for that. And it's great to hear that things are definitely changing. I guess, Kelly, do you have anything to comment on barriers to women getting in the C-suite? Yes, I have two big bugbears here, actually. And they've kind of been mentioned already. So I guess to build on Shani's point, similarly at Telstra, we have parental leave policy for males and females. It's exactly the same. And, you know, when that first came out, I think that everyone was like, this is amazing for men to be able to share in childcare and having that relationship with their children in the first year of their life. But one of the great benefits then is that means now women cannot be overlooked for roles because they are at an age where they are of you know childbearing years that is definitely an area of progression but I do still have and I do still see a huge systemic issue more broadly in maternity leave policies that collectively needs to be addressed and that is that most companies have a policy that you have to be with them for 12 months before you can access maternity leave and so if you were to highlight that from what that actually means so if you're a woman thinking you'd like to start a family soon, that means you're either stuck where you are and you can't take advantage of taking on a new opportunity and progressing your career, even though you have no idea how long it will take you to fall pregnant and it might be a really long and painful journey, or you decide to change jobs, take on a new challenge, and then you have to put that personal journey on hold. And that could end up having really serious consequences for your family. So in that way, women have to make a choice on which to limit out of career and family before they even have a family in a way that males don't. So that's just an extra take on the maternity leave issue. And then I guess just the other thing, and we sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but again, I think that we've been too focused on females trying to build skills to succeed in a man's world and not focusing on males trying to recognise skills in diverse talent. And that lack of diversity, as we've mentioned, it extends beyond females, but we've still got a long way to go to address those systemic issues of underdevelopment of female talent and under emphasis of the consequences of that lack of diversity and inclusion. Yeah, that's really interesting you mentioned that, Kelly. In your experiences, what would you say are some of the main benefits of having more women in leadership roles? Just, um, I don't know, even just from like talking about that emotional side of things or just the way women handle situations differently. I guess, yeah, I've always enjoyed being surrounded with female leaders. So I'm just wondering if any of you have had positive experiences with that. Can I be controversial and say the more female leaders are around, the less I actually notice the gender of the leaders. I think that the only times I've really noticed gender is when, similar to something Bronwyn touched on about half an hour ago, there was actually a time where I was on a project and we had a team meeting and it was 10 men and me. And that was a really stark experience and something that I walked into being like, this is going to be my time to prove that I, I don't care. I can hold my own. I'm going to show these men that it doesn't matter. And I was quite happy with, with that situation, but also it was a stark reminder of, well, hey, something's not quite right here. If there's 10 men and one woman, and that woman is the most junior person on the team. But then I've been in other teams where there's been a mix, some where there's more female dominated or it's more equal. And those are the ones where you don't really notice it. And I think I'm lucky and maybe a bit bright eyed and bushy tailed that I've walked into my career and started it at a time where there has been such diversity that I haven't really had to firsthand experience any of that either underlying discrimination or just feeling like there aren't as many females around. So for me, it's something that I don't really think about day to day because it's ingrained in, in my culture and my team. 
Uh, I was just going to say, I just think it's so fantastic now that we're so willing to call out gender imbalance in the workplace. And we're so accustomed to just expecting better because the fact that we expect balance in gender diversity means that it is becoming more prevalent and it is more accepted and there are environments in which we feel like we can call it out. So I think that that's a really great step change. We've still got a way to go, but how willing we are to call it out and how much we expect it, we expect that we will do the right thing there is is a huge step forward. You guys have all offered so um, much valuable conversation to the podcast. I suppose to finish up, if you were to picture yourself as a 19, 20-year-old, what is one piece of advice that you would tell yourself if you could go back? Oh, man. Honestly, looking back, I work in a job where you can't really, there aren't really technical skills you can learn for it. There are some, like data analysis, but I didn't particularly want to study a lot of that when I was at uni. I think the reality for me and the one thing I'd say to myself is expect to be uncomfortable every day, expect to deal with ambiguity and to feel out of your depths on a daily basis and get comfortable with admitting what you don't know, because that is not a sign of weakness. That is a sign of a growth mindset. And chances are, if you admit that you're not sure on something, the person you say it to, or if you're in a group, someone else is also going to be like, oh, I had that same question. Or the person is going to say, oh, of course you you didn't know that. And I'm so sorry I didn't explain it to you. Or, hey, that's a totally valid thing to be unsure of. Let's workshop it together. So I think being comfortable with that vulnerability is amazing because then that leads you to grow rather than keeping it to yourself, working through it internally, which then leads into the imposter syndrome, which then leads you to feel like you have to figure it out on your all on your own. You don't have to figure it all out on your own. Yeah, that's really great advice, Shani. Um, what about you, Kelly? I was actually going to say some of the exact same things as Shani, so I'm trying to Sorry. think of new things now. <laughs> I was definitely going to say get comfortable with being uncomfortable, embracing ambiguity, embracing new opportunities. And I guess just the other thing that I would also say is there's been times in my career when I've been really ambitious and that's really served me well. But there's also been times when career progression hasn't kind of been on my mind because of other things. And that's been okay too. So I guess it's just your journey is your own and recognize what you value at different times and and keep building upon that. You can't really do anything wrong by embracing opportunities. Yeah, I would say to my younger self, just to believe in yourself more and just give things a go. Like, don't be scared of failure or or making mistakes. It's part of life and it's part of the journey. And, And looking back, some of my what, you know, maybe considered failures have actually been the areas where I've grown the most and actually presented opportunities that if I had to go back, I wouldn't change them. So just to really believe in myself and get out of my comfort zone and just just give things a crack. That's such great advice. So I just wanted to thank you all so much for joining us today. I think our listeners will be able to learn a lot. It was so much inspiring advice that I think we can all take on board. So thank you all. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of SamCast. Stay tuned for future episodes where we delve into other interesting topics in the world of marketing and management. And thank you again to our guests for being here.